First of all, welcome very much to our get together tonight. We're Voices for Scotland. I'm Clara. Tonight, we're very lucky because we've got Bill Austin with us, who's an expert on customs and excise, who has written a report on um, the Scottish border invited by the SIC. The SIC has recently announced that they're releasing separ um, several reports on the big questions that Scotland needs to answer once independent and how we can build the institutions that we're going to need. And the report written by Bill is going to be the first one um, released soon. And it's on smart borders and borders in general. So when I'm saying that we've got um, an expert with us tonight, I'm, I'm not um, underselling Bill. He's been a higher executive officer with HM Customs for 30 years. And he's also been working as an international customs and excise consultant, Ethiopia, oh gosh, my pronunciation, Djibouti and the Republic of Congo. We're very lucky to have someone here tonight who can talk to us about borders because I know borders is one of those topics that has a lot of interest. And um, we all know that borders are impacting us, but it's not necessarily something that we've got a lot of expertise on. What we're going to do today is we have Bill talking for about 15 minutes on borders and the report that he has written. And then we'll hand over into um, our usual discussion. So... Bill, I'm going to pass over to you. Is there anything else you'd like to mention about yourself that I didn't? Yeah, just just um, to, to clarify that during uh, the time of my customs service, I was also in the army. And so there was a lot of crossover between uh, customs, borders and defence. And it's actually quite intrinsic to what, what we're going to talk about. And then equally that in amongst all of that, as a mature student, I did a year at uh, the Department of War Studies at Glasgow University, where uh, I did a, a research degree on anti-smuggling in Northern Ireland. And given that Northern Ireland is only 12 miles away from us, it's actually quite quite a crunchy subject. Um, so, yeah, those are the bits filled in. Super. OK, thanks very much, everybody, for joining. This is the, the third gig I've had in uh, two days. Um, so it's actually quite amazing that, that there's so much interest in customs and borders, but I can guess why. So what I would like to do is start off by suggesting that for the next 15 minutes, I'm going to break down the subject into four bite-sized chunks where we are currently with the UK, hard borders and the ramifications of that, an aspirational Scottish customs service, and then finally, where do we want to end up what are we actually aspiring to? So as a benchmark, no better place to start than the EU's definition of integrated border management, because at the end of the day, whether Scotland's in EU or EFTA, we're going to have to play by EU rules. So it makes sense for everybody to have something to hang their hats on in terms of where we want to be and all evidence where UK currently is not. The EU definition of integrated borders management, or IBM, is that national and international coordination amongst all relevant authorities and agencies involved in border security and trade facilitation is to establish effective, efficient and coordinated border management at the external EU borders in order to reach the objective of open, keyword open, but well-controlled and secure borders. This is the, the start and finish of the customs and borders argument because where we are with the UK, I'd strongly suggest it's extremely dysfunctional because what we have is the priority for UK government is anti-immigration and it has been for quite a while. So what you then have is UK policy is focused on anti-immigration. And what that means is primacy at the borders is given to the UK border force. Those are anti-immigration guys. They do maybe about 10% of customs work as an agency task. So right there, when it comes to where does Scotland fit in, in terms of let's collect revenues, because traditionally that's what customs do. The UK doesn't, they've got UK BF, those are the guys at ports and airports. There hasn't been 
a UK customs officer at a port or an airport since 2005. Gordon Brown got rid of HM Customs and Excise in 2005. So when you walk through Glasgow Airport or Edinburgh Airport and you see customs, it's a big fig leaf. There hasn't been a customs officer there for 15 years. So what? Well, what that means is that in terms of recognised international primacy where the customs guys control the movement of people and goods, then, then that's out the window. What we have is the UKBF is run by the Home Office, Pretty Patel and our black shirts. That's not a good thing. What I'm suggesting is that in terms of teaching people in Africa, in East Africa, about customs uh, regimes, the big don't example is UK. Don't do this because you won't collect very much revenue. You'll screw a lot of people around. You'll make your country an unwelcome place, which is a contrived thing with the UK government. So that when you step off an aircraft, you see UK border and guys in black with silver insignia. That's reminiscent of a, an age past that wasn't actually very nice. Is that what we want to do? Is that what Scotland wants to do? Because in amongst that poor governance, I have to introduce the tax gap to you because the tax gap is identified by Professor Richard Murphy, who reckons currently the tax gap in the UK is £120 billion. That is revenues identified but uncollected. So how can that be? I mean, that doesn't make sense. Well, the answer is lack of resources and lack of political willingness to actually go after revenues that the NHS need, that our pensioners need. And you only need to switch on the TV tonight to the news and to see that the UK is heading to what they would have called uh, a third world banana republic in terms of completely in debt, etc and no real organisation to deal with the tax gap. In amongst that, the tax gap mix is smuggling, you know, revenues that go wide. Interestingly, if you want to go into the Business for Scotland website, they've got a couple of really, really good slides on this sort of thing. And they evidence that part of this political will that exists in London and where their priorities are, that you look at Esso and Shell as oil companies, and in a similar period, Norway collects 80 billion a year. What UK does is give those two oil corporations money. We subsidise them, which is nothing short of remarkable. So what I'm suggesting to you is have a look at Business for Scotland website on the, the economics and where revenues fit in, because it's really, really interesting. That takes us to hard borders. So we have a slide. OK, let's just go with the hard border issue. What does it mean? What you've got in front of you is uh, a map of Scotland and its territorial waters. What would invite you to do right away is don't think borders. Think legal jurisdiction. And what I would argue is this is one of the ways to a, slaughter the hard border demon, but also invite soft no voters to think in terms of what would a Scottish Customs Service have to do, what the UK is currently isn't doing within our legal jurisdiction, because it changes the perspective immediately. And anybody that starts talking about hard borders immediately starts to suggest they don't know what they're talking about. So let's go with this. A bit of audience participation. Every single one of you are now in the, the new Scottish Customs Service. OK, you're all, Scot you're all customs officers, right? And there's about a thousand newly recruited day one of independence. And we're all front foot. We're all enthusiastic. But we're going to go with the hard border thing. We'll, we'll play the game that we all run about with our hair on fire. And we shout hard border, hard border. We have to deal with this. OK, so we all run down to that bit of land between Solway and Tweed, because that's where the hard border is, isn't it? Each of us gets a sentry box, and at every 10 metres, we individually man 
a sentry box on the hard border and we control that border, we take back control. Some of you might have a clipboard, some of you might back have big aggressive dogs and big leashes and stuff like that and we shout ah across the border because that's what hard border is. Okay, smashing, good, we've established the hard border. Now, as reasonable individuals, let's take a look at the map. We've got a thousand guys down in the hard border shouting at passing traffic on the M74 and the A1. And then we have a look at the map. Okay, pub quiz question. What is the length of the coastline of Scotland? Okay, the coastline at high tide, because this is important, is 18,672 kilometres of coastline, which is actually a border, isn't it? Because a ship can come in from abroad and land anywhere in Scotland. So let's pick Barra, let's pick Unst, let's pick Ballantrae. We're all doing the hard border thing and ships, smugglers, are bringing in cognac and cigarettes and all other good stuff all over Scotland. Just remind me again, how is it we're going to control that? Because we've only got a thousand dudes. So, so somebody's shouting, but we've also got airports. We, we, have, we have to do the airports. Well, we can't. We're doing hard border. We're doing Solway and Tweed. Well, this is becoming a bit kind of silly, isn't it? Because maybe if we had a revenue strategy, determined by the Scottish Government, who would carry out risk management analysis, and they would identify where is the most likely sources of under declarations and revenue to be raised. I think the conclusion won't be having a thousand of us strung out in the border between Solway and Tweed. In fact, let's agree it's just lunatic. Okay, so where do we go from there? Well, having carried out our risk management analysis, we have to carry out risk management. So you guys are all invited to think in terms of, oh, right, okay, so I'm in the new customs service. I can collect value-added tax. Mm, that's right, that's exciting. Or I could be in uniform chasing smugglers up and down Ballantrae Beach. Oh, that's a bit sexy. That's fun. Trust me, it is. Um, that we could actually get some job satisfaction out of this and actually do a job for our treasury. Because again, I illustrate the fact that looking at that screen, we're not going to be doing anti-immigration. We're going to be traditional customs officers working for our treasury to find revenues for our NHS, for our pensions, for our infrastructure. Oh, did I say infrastructure? Okay, so we're independent. We have another look at the map and we say, where are our roll-off, roll-on terminals to Scandinavia and the EU? Well, actually, currently, we're a bit rural-less. Okay, we'll have something going in Resyth. We've got something going in NIG, but that's it. We send all our traffic, a lot of our commerce, down to English ports. OK, so what I would suggest is within the revenue strategy, because customs and excise are good guys who are there to enlarge the economic cake. They're not there to inconvenience people, be confrontational, which is what the UK policy currently is. We're there to facilitate and educate international traders in order to make our community economic cake bigger. So there's got to be a, a conversation somewhere in revenue strategy to suggest, well, actually, do you know what? We could be doing with a roll-on, roll-off terminal, for example, to Scandinavia and one to Edinburgh. How are we going to finance that? Well, that, that's a drama, isn't it? But then if we say, do you know what? If we do that, it will pay for itself because we can do revenue projections that will boost the Scottish economy. Therefore, the technical phrase here is, the revenue washes through, if that makes sense, because when the people are buying white goods like uh, fridges or cars and all the rest, that you're paying VAT on it. You're paying excise and VAT on the fuel and the new vehicles, yada, yada. It's all good. That's what I'm saying. So 
to illustrate what we've got with the UK, on the one hand, we've got Home Office, Pretty Patel, anti-immigration. And on the other hand, we've got uh, Mr Sunak with the Treasury and an organisation called HM Revenue and Customs, except the customs part doesn't do borders and ports because they haven't done that since 2005. They're inland. They collect VAT, they collect excise. So they're not in a position to influence revenue collection at the ports. They have a memorandum of understanding, which is actually out of date. So that they're, they're sort of lumbering along right now in a way that what I'm suggesting is we wouldn't. So again, a bit of audience participation went really well the first time. Um, I invite you to, to grab your phone and Google World Customs Organization. Shouldn't take too long. It's WCOOMD.org. Just just in the front page, you'll have uh, the usual search box. And what I invite you to do is put in hard border and then tell me what comes up. As everybody's playing this game, I'll let you know you won't get an answer because the WCO, the overarching international customs organization, doesn't recognize the concept of hard border. This is a good game to play because when you're speaking to soft no voters and they say, we've got to have a hard border. Okay, mate, get your phone out, have a look at the WCO and tell me when you can find hard border. So the next point is, let's do it again. But this time, put in EU Aquis, that's Alpha Charlie Quebec Uniform India Sierra, the EU Aquis. Uh, you should find a page which has about 14 chapters set up by the EU. And basically, them's the rules for joining the EU. They're not prescriptive, but many of them relate directly to customs controls. And again, on the search engine, put in hard borders. I know the answer to this one as well. You won't find it. Well, in fact, it might be in that secret chapter, you know, the one that Boris Johnson had, the EU chapter in Straight Bananas. I think it's in there somewhere. OK, so what I'm saying is, in order to join or rejoin the EU, or even through EFTA, the EU Aquis don't require hard border. It's not prescriptive. The EU say, we need you to find X amount of revenue and protect the very systems, happy days. But they don't tell you how to do it. They don't tell you you need a, a, a sentry box every 10 metres on the land boundary between Scotland and England. Far from it. But what a Scottish Customs Service, what a Scottish Treasury would have to satisfy the EU that, look, we're playing by the rules, we understand the rules, and here they are, here's a big plan. Would anybody like to have a look at that? In fact, here's a better idea. Can we have a couple of EU blokes across where we're doing it so that we can do a left-hand, right-hand liaison so that we've got it right? I'm sure they would like that. Can you, can you see where I'm going with this? The, the hard borders thing is mainstream media pejorative. It's project fear. It doesn't mean anything. It's not recognised by the World Customs Organisation. It's not recognised by the EU. It's, it's rubbish. We decide how we allocate our resources. And I invite you to look back at the map again. I try to find out how many 20-foot shipping containers drive up the M6 uh, onto the M74 in Scotland at Gretna. And I couldn't really, I couldn't really do it accurately because of, so if I gave you a figure, it would be bluffing. However, what I was able to establish is, if you look at the map, Port of Greenock, just up to the right-hand side of Arran there, uh, they take in 200,000 20-foot shipping containers annually. <laughs> Back to where we're putting more resources. Are we all going to be in sentry boxes on the hard border? Or is anybody going to be having a look at 200,000 shipping containers coming into Greenock? And here's the thing. How about Grangemouth Container Terminal? How about the new roll-on or roll-off ferry ports that will be essential for us? Can I throw in another one? The North Route. As the polar ice cap is melting, what, what we're going to have is a lot of ships 
who are who will be coming from north to south from Russia and China because it halves the amount of sailing time to get to Europe. Some of these container ships now currently can carry 23,000 boxes each. When I say box, that's a container. 23,000 shipping containers per vessel. So what, what are our resources going to be uh, if those ships come in to Scotland? Because we have been so switched on with our infrastructure, uh, we have got the berths to take those vessels. And in terms of logistics, cross-loading, any, any logis logistician uh, knows that it's better to take a lot of kit to one place and then shuttle it from a convenient base. So what I'm suggesting to Scott Gov is, wouldn't it be great if we set ourselves up as a European hub for all this Russian and Chinese traffic that's going to be coming down the North Sea like Sucky Hall Street on a Saturday night? It's just a thought. Just to emphasise this, that second point, it's legal jurisdiction. We are responsible for that whole patch that you see there. And the final point I would make is that uh, when we're all down in the hard border doing our thing with our big hairy dugs, is who's doing the eBay and Amazon imports from Japan and America? Oh, how, how do we do hard border in cyberspace? How does that work? Just a thought. Okay, I'd also suggest actually maybe that when it comes to borders, as in border, 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 it's a bit of a red herring because when you look at the map, legal jurisdiction is far more important as an issue than a line in a map that was decided by an empire 300 years ago. Does that make sense? Cool. Okay, third part. What do we want to do to aspire uh, in terms of having a, a customs service? Well, I've already actually said that what we want Scottish government to do is have a revenue strategy. The customs service are one cog in that wheel because you've got everything from council tax to potentially land tax, traditional revenues like excise, which is uh, on fuels and alcohol. Well, as fuel use is going down, that has to be replaced. As tobacco use comes down, all the billions that we're currently earning from tobacco, that'll have to be replaced. So what I'm saying is that the Scottish Government revenue strategy is a moving feast, okay? And customs would do what it's told within targets to go and collect that revenue to ensure that the NHS is provided for our pensions and all the rest of it, which is actually quite an exciting thing. So if we're not going to be strung out on a, a line and defence wise, military defence wise, I've got to suggest that customs protocols are the same. You don't have static and linear because everybody knows where you are. And they can dig underneath you or go, go over you or around you. Static and linear is daft. The military and the customs switched on are mobile and in depth. So what I'm saying is our smart border area, if you like, might be Tweed, Solway, Glasgow, Edinburgh. And if you think of it in terms of a chessboard, okay, lots of black squares, lots of white squares. On any given rota, we move our people only in the black pieces on the black squares or maybe we switch that to the white squares and we go three lots of squares back. I hope everybody's following us. Um, what it means is the bad guys don't know where you are. It's us that's moving about. It's us that's on the front foot. We are trying to take the initiative. They start to think they are surrounded because we are, we are, we are moving about all the time. We're boxing clever. That's what smart borders means. To the extent that, we can start to play mind games with these guys because we, we all know how notorious the Newcastle Brown smugglers are from Newcastle, don't we? I mean, there's going to be caravans in UK Brown coming up the, coming up the road from uh, Newcastle. So we're going to have to think about that. What I suggest is on our chessboard, we block off 
the main black squares, shall we say, leaving only a couple available for them to move their goods. And do you know what? If we're sitting a wee bit further back and we're observing their routes, we canalise them into our area, into areas of our choosing, and we say, hello, you, this is me. Now, it sounds very simplistic, but I can assure you it's great fun, it's great sport, because part of the job satisfaction about being a customs officer is, do you know what? See, when you seize that contraband, and maybe actually the big truck or the Ford before that the smugglers using, because the new customs service will be able to use seized aircraft, vessels, vehicles. It spoils the smugglers' day, but it's also good news from the customs point of view, because you get to keep the goods. Yeah, you sell them or you use them yourself. OK, so I'm bluffing. I'm making all of this up. Well, do you know, uh, last week in Glasgow, uh, there was, what, um, one and a half, uh, four million cigarettes seized in the city centre contraband. The revenue lost would have been 1.5 million. So that's current and that's recent. If we look for other recent examples, I had a look at how my Irish colleagues are getting on. What they have done in terms of integrated border management, they have an organisation called the Joint Agency Task Force, which is cross-border, cross-agency. Sounds a bit like IBM to me. And uh, what they did in May was they had a, a cracking job in Newry in Carlingford, and they seized 8 million cigarettes, revenue to be lost 3 million euros. So what I'm suggesting is smuggling is has been going on for centuries. It won't stop. A Scottish customs service would be there to interdict the illegality, but that is only as a last resort because our focus must be education and facilitation to make that economic cake bigger. What I mean by that is the way it's normally taught uh, simplistically is a traffic light system that we, through our risk analysis, would identify the compliant importers and exporters, and we'll call them green. Okay, then from a risk analysis, we identify the, the, the orange traders who have maybe just started, they don't really, really know the rules, and they would benefit a lot from uh, an educational visit to bring them into the green category, because we don't want them to go into the red category, because that's the bad guys. And that, if you think about it, we've only got a thousand dudes. Where are we going to put in our priorities in terms of deploying our resources? Because we're going to have to think about it. OK. And within the smuggling, I say again, the tax gap, it's, it's 120 billion UK. Well, between pals, if you call that, OK, 10% of that is ours. Every time somebody says, but you've got an economic black hole of 15, well, Buffalo Bill's big idea for the day has just found 10. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's up to us as a community to decide what we want to do in terms of our custom service and how it actually operates in an ambassadorial sort of way. Because very, very often when a ship comes into a Scottish port for the first time, back in the day, the first guy you met was a customs officer. So if you're <laughs> it is wrong to go nose to nose with a skipper and say, right, OK, where's all your papers? How many immigrants have you got in your boat? And all that? I say, stop, stop, stop. Rewind and get the coffee out. OK, how can we help you? Is everything OK? And that's the same with the international traders that we, the Scottish Customs Service, must aspire to facilitating trade. We're nice people. You would love to invest in our country. How can we help you? That's not what the UK is doing. Well, I think maybe looking at the time, um, sh shall we move over to questions? Um, yeah, soon? sure. I think we had um, our first um, hand raise. Wait, Bill Ramsey, is that a question from you? It is, yes. I think it's all very, it's, it's really interesting. Um, but I want to bring it back to the politics and conception. Conceptually, the hard border is a very simple thing to understand. And how do we, t I mean, if we had politicians who were able to stand up and say, 
it doesn't matter, then that would be good because then it begs the discourse. But since we have no politicians who have the intellectual self-confidence to say it doesn't matter in the way you said it, how do we resolve that? We, we, we resolve that by, I would suggest, by being positive and to illustrate that the border, hard border, is actually a bit of a red herring, that we talk legal jurisdiction and that we control our revenues within our legal ju jurisdiction with a priority of facilitating and educating trade. The law enforcement part of customs and excise is a last resort. I'd make a, a further illustration about the hard border thing. Somebody asked me, where did the phrase come from? And for the life of me, I didn't know, so I did a bit of digging. And we, on the left hand, we pretty Patel in the Home Office. Hard border was sexy because it meant you were aggressive and you were chasing off unwanted individuals. But it's come back and bit them in the, in the, 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 the hind end a wee bit because on the customs side, on the Treasury side, hard border is negative because it hardly facilitates the movement of trade. And this is a dichotomy that the UK government find itself in. They don't know whether their, 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 their hind end is bored or countersunk. Hard borders, hooray, scare away the, the, the immigrants. You move to the north of Ireland, oh, hard border, that's a bad thing. We can't have hard border. Damn right. So th there's two answers, I think, to, to your question. First of all, to illustrate the stupidity of the hard border concept and how pejorative it is, and then illustrate the positive, which is legal jurisdiction, collect lots of revenue for our NHS, for our pensions. But that takes political will, which I think is the thrust of your argument. I live in Brussels and I used to work for the European Parliament. I obviously do not speak for them or for any of the European institutions. But as far as we're concerned, hard border and soft border are meaningless terms. And that's why you won't find them in the Aki. What we need to know is, can they uphold the integrity of the single market? Can they carry out SPS checks? Can they prevent injured species um, from being illegally traded? Yes. And that requires border checks. So what we would need to know from an independent Scotland is, in terms of your alignment with the European Union's trade rules and protecting the integrity of the single market, how do you plan to uphold that? while remaining, while trying to retain cross-border trade with the United Kingdom, which could have wildly different, far, far inferior food safety standards? Well, actually, the answer is a lot easier than one might think. Uh, and in terms of inter international uh, customs controls, it's accepted across the planet that customs controls are carried out wherever the respective government wishes them to. That doesn't necessarily mean at the junction of the M6 and the M74. If the Scottish government say within the EU uh, rules that we must comply with, then we will carry out uh, those customs checks at the traders' premises when it arrives. And let's say the traders' premises is in Ullapool. Why would we not? Then equally, we may actually be a wee bit more formalised. And Germany, for example, is very swept up with an inland clearance depot system where within the country, let's say somewhere on the M8 between Glasgow and Edinburgh, let's say somewhere between Glasgow and Inverness, that we have inland clearance depots where when the vehicle crosses from England into Scotland, it goes to one of those locations and the customs controls are carried out there. Again, thank you very much for the question because it illustrates that for many, many people, customs controls equal borders. They don't. They never have done. As soon as the single market came in in 1993, it changed everything. 
what I'm suggesting is the smart borders aspect where you can identify vehicles, vehicle registrations as they cross the border electronically, that is that is uh, that assists in determining traffic and where the customer would allocate its resources. Again, what we, we our, our priorities have got to be to facilitate and educate. Look, uh, when you cross from Scot from England into Scotland, you have 24 hours to get yourself to Ullapool because actually within a swept up smart EU system, uh, I'm going to get technical here, we can do as many pre-arrival declarations, customs declarations, as people want to. What have I just said? I've just said that a 20 foot container truck in the Netherlands, his company gets online and makes a Scottish customs declaration before the wagon has left Nijmegen. It leaves the Netherlands, it arrives at our new Roro terminal somewhere on the East Coast, and it gets itself up to Thurso, where a customs officer, it's all pre-arranged, if it's required, will carry out customs controls. What I'm suggesting strongly is, this is the legal jurisdiction think, that we are entitled under international law and certainly EU law, because the Germans do it, the French are very good at it. In fact, I think, incidentally, the French collect about 90% of their douane revenue inland, not at the border. Okay, does that answer your question? And to an extent, it's more in terms of we've been hearing quite a lot of we'll have these digital checks, we'll have the smart border, we'll have these alternative arrangements. How does it and work in practice? Yeah, and I suspect that they might be met with some um, suspicion, shall I say, in the but, process of negotiating it, just because of the the case that has surrounded that and the kind of amount of stress that it has put on EU member states. Um, um, so that would be something that needs to be taken into account. So to an okay. extent... Yeah, I mean, th th there's two aspects to that. Um, the World Customs Organization have an international network of customs universities and they have a, a scheme called PCAP. So it's a fairly all informed, swept up best practice system. Germany has maybe about 12 universities who are part of the international network of customs uh, universities. The UK has none. So there's the academic supporting government decision side of life which it's great to have the actual customs officers being included in the academic theory side of it. But then how are you actually going to implement it? Well, again, I strongly come back. Uh, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to take part in the EU Customs Matthias programme. I worked in, uh, in uh, Ireland and France, and I hosted uh, officers from Denmark. Well, do you know, funny old thing, it wasn't random. You did it in a structured manner that what, what do we need to learn from uh, Dublin or, or Copenhagen? So in answer to your question, uh, on, in the first instance, we've got the academic side, let's ensure we're on side, but let's be fully integrated border management on an EU scale. Let's play the game. Let, let's not say Brussels poke off because we have taken back control of our borders. Woodruff was just making a comment um, in the chat saying that we should start distinguishing between a physical border, one with blockades and checkpoints, and a hard border in terms of customs. I guess yeah. that fits in what, in what you've just said. Yeah, it's, 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 it's absolutely nailing legal jurisdiction versus a line in a map. I've got one or two questions. Um, the, the first one is... Can you put in any kind of order of priority the roles of the customs and excise service, i.e. Uh, how important is the facilitating of trade compared with the collecting of, of revenue uh, that is uh, from people who want to evade uh, the revenue smuggling, in other words, and uh, the, uh, the, the tracking, if you like, of... Um, of people trying uh, to cross uh, borders from one 
jurisdiction into another. That it seems to me there are these three and maybe more areas which uh, need to ha have uh, some kind of priority attached to them. The, the second thing is um, all of the legal transitions of goods and materials should be able to be uh, documented prior to their, their actually travelling. And you'd only need random checks to make sure that, that the documentation is correctly filled in and that the, that the goods are actually as described. And then the last thing is there are various threads intertwined in your talk. And I thought Bill was going to come on to that when he talked about Margaret Thatcher, but he didn't actually develop it. The idea that, that taxes and uh, revenue streams from uh, customs and excise are used to pay for services is one that we have to move away from. Taxes have an entirely different role in the economy from that. Uh, and, and the idea that uh, how are we going to pay for it, we'll need to raise taxes, that is entirely false. Uh, the government can, a uh, 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 currency issuing government can produce its, as much currency as it wishes. And it uses taxation in various ways uh, to incentivize things, to disincentivize things. That, that, that's the, the, the drink and the cigarettes. Um, but also to, uh, to act as a, a control on inflation if, if that becomes necessary. So, and, and the, the figure of the deficit of 15 billion or whatever it is, that's derived from a completely faulty set of data uh, in the JERS figures. So we, we need to kind of separate the myths and the mythology from the, the facts on the ground. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I feel that there's a, an element of confusion among all of these things that you've been saying. Okay, so hopefully when my paper is released, a lot will become clearer than uh, a 15 minute preamble. Uh, everything at the end of the day comes down to national government strategy. What, what, what direction do we want to go in? And from that, we, we, we would have a national revenue strategy. What do we want to raise and how do we want to do that? And within the law, we have to start thinking, well, how do we make this easy for people to understand so that it's in a black and white situation? I suggest there must be revenue sections within our written constitution. Something funky like right tax at the right time or wealth generated in Scotland will attract revenues in Scotland. Moving the wealth generated out of the country doesn't absolve them from the revenues. So this is all big picture stuff. And within that, again, with the, the, the Burak that the UK has, who has primacy on customs within our legal jurisdiction? Currently, in the UK system, it's an immigration service. But surely, if we're going to have an understandable strategy, supported by law, clearly understood, OK, customs, we want you to do this, cops do that, immigration service, that it all, all has to be done ideally in a Jack and Jill manner, because I totally agree with what you're saying. And then amongst all of that stuff, if uh, in terms of further reading and how it actually could be done, have you read a book called The Joy of Tax? Yeah, I know of it. I haven't read it. Yeah, it's, it's a stonking read, uh, Professor, uh, Professor Murphy. And he puts it in monosyllabic terms that even I can understand that in terms of revenues, it's, it has to be done as a package. You, you can't just have random standalone revenues that a guy is astonished that he suddenly has to pay, etc. People have to understand why the revenues are being raised and why particular aspects of society have to pay it. Obviously, you know, next week, it's, this is dead easy because I'll teach you how to nail jelly to the ceiling. That's a lot easier, you know? Yeah, I, 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 read, I read Richard Murphy quite a lot on his blog, but uh, I've not actually waded through his book. In, from it, it, in, uh, Joy of Tax is very, very good and also Courageous State and the, the, the clues in the name. 
Thank you very much indeed. That's that's very good. You're welcome, Julian. Uh, it still doesn't get to the political issue, I'm afraid. I understood uh, the, the you know the necessaries of total war and revenue raising in a total war concept. I got that, and that read me on to Richard Murphy. But to the ordinary people in the street, it's counterintuitive. Thatcher still rules. Laura Coonsberg tells us we're broke. No politician of any type has been able to go on of any party, including my own beloved party. I mean, you know, the young 30-year-old replacement lassie who's very good, Kate Forbes, very good communicator, she doesn't still have the self-confidence or is allowed to turn around and say, this is ed- so economic illiteracy, this is nonsense. You know, until we're politicians, develop some degree of self-confidence and start to say, this is nonsense, it doesn't make sense, because they have the media outlets, we need how do we get these count how do we develop counterintuitive ideas because we have a political challenge uh, and 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 i don't see how, at the moment maybe, maybe northern ireland maybe when it all you know maybe, maybe when the systems that you've described come out you know that that may well work even the idea of 12 universities in germany britain having none yet britain's position is sustainable clearly politically it's sustainable it gets results for the Conservatives and previous governments. So there's a political challenge for us as to how do we turn the hard border concept into a nonsense in a basic way, if you get my, get my drift. And that's the challenge. And the, 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 the politics, a, a customs officer at the end of the day is a civil servant who does what he's told. So in terms of the politics, well, that's actually the responsibility of the community to vote in the political party that elucidates how revenues, the tax burden would be better with the multinationals and the huge corporations and not as it currently is with a guy in the street and small and medium enterprises. And hold that thought, when you have a look at Scotland's future, which was produced in 2014, all it said, customs and borders wise, was let's recreate the dysfunctional UK system on a mini basis. Stop, 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 stop. We've got a chance to plug into the WCO and the EU and aspire to be within the top five customs revenue organisations within the planet. Trust me, that's really, really exciting because not only does it, it uh, potentially increase the flow of revenues to ensure that our pensions aren't in the bottom quartile, or actually if the multinationals and all the rest of them, they pay their, their, their money. As a retired guy myself, my 12,000 uh, tax threshold might be 15,000. In fact, let, let's go daft, let's go tonto, let's make it 20,000 because the tax burden has been shifted. But that's political will. And frankly, the Growth Commission, etc. in the name of God. <laughs> there you go. You know, you, you look for customs revenues in that document and uh, my eyes were bleeding. Faye was just saying thank you for giving such a clear view over the EU single market position as well. And um, that her base of knowledge is currently being filled. And I think that goes in head as well with what Bill Ramsey was saying again, you know, it is a very complex issue and you need to break it down because even when you read a report like this and even when you go to meetings like this, there's still a lot of questions that um, we leave with. But I certainly feel a lot clearer on um, the issue of a hard border than I have ever felt. And I think these are this is sort of the um, the reason behind the transition papers and the work that we're trying to do is to, you know, take this big chunk of expertise and to try and break it down. And we all have a role to play in that of, you know, trying to understand it and then pass on the knowledge. And um, I think Bill gave us some some very nice um, tools today um, on how to do that. I think I'm definitely going to crack out the good old um, go to the World Customs Organization page. And I certainly didn't think I was going to end up with the mindset of a border um, you know, customs officer <laughs> and chasing down the smugglers. I think on that note, is if there's not any further um, comments or questions, we'll probably call it a day. Extra, extra big thank to um, Bill. Thank you so much. I think this was really, really interesting and surely answered a lot of questions. And yeah, I look forward to um, reading the report and getting more more out of that as well. 
Yeah, it's really nice to meet everybody. Thanks for everybody coming in. If you do want to dig now on Facebook or I've got a, a, a website, if you want to ask questions, etc., cetera, uh, feel free to, to, to get in touch. Thank you very much, everyone, and um, I hope to see you again. You're listening to Indie Live Radio and this week's Yes Group Spotlight. So we've been listening to Bill Orson talking to Voices for Scotland about an independent Scotland's options for setting up a new revenue and borders system. Bill gave the same talk to Yes Sky on Lochalsh. So what we're going to do now is move over to Yes Sky on Lochalsh Group's question and answers with Bill. They've listened to the same talk that Bill gave to Voices for Scotland people, and now they're asking questions in response to that. Okay, so the next one we've got is another one from Lynn Dugan. Would you like to ask your question, Lynn? Happy to. Yeah, just wondering, um, talking about the, the ports we've got, do we have sufficient ports that would be able to service the imports and exports necessary for Scotland to thrive independently? Are they no. at the stage where they, they, their, their functionality is ready for us to go type of thing? It's a cracking question because the first part of the answer is international trade is rising exponentially, which means there's going to be an awful lot more air traffic and sea traffic. So in answer to your question, we've got to want to be. And the answer to your question lies direct, directly with government infrastructure. Um, if I, I made the point about not having rural terminals on the east coast of the continent of Scandinavia, that's a stick on. We, we must do that. Do we have that right now? No, we don't. So again, you know, are we planning for independence? Well, do you know what? We should be planning for independence, but we should have one eye firmly on raising revenue. And by that, I mean, for our economy, that's, that's what I was trying to say about making the cake bigger. We can, we, we're an exporting nation. So why would we not have ports and airports that can export? And having a customs officer, a friendly face that helps traders get the stuff out of the country as seamlessly as possible. There's a question here saying, do you have a breakdown of the difference between Stat Oil and corporations? No, I don't. This is, this is part of the statistical desert issue that one of the first things a Scottish government would have to set up is a robust statistical service so that we've all got a, a baldy clue of what we're buying and selling, because frankly, we don't. Okay. Um, do you envisage number plate recognition as a need at the Scottish Roads border? Well, in terms of um, risk management, then you would use every form of um, aid that you, that you could, uh, you know, the, 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 the Department of Transport have kit that's on the border right now, which read VRNs, uh, vehicle registration, so do the cops then it would be a building block that customs would use. But actually, it's, it neatly leads into the fact that because we don't have any customs stations anywhere on the coast, traditionally, if lights were spotted off the west coast of Sky, you would have customs money that uh, you could go and find and have a chat. Um, because I, I think uh, it alludes to um, the, the story that I told the last time of the, uh, the, the the vessel that was um, had left North Africa, it was being followed by the Navy covertly and they lost it somewhere off the west of Scotland. And one of my colleagues uh, said, well, where was it last seen? And he made a series of phone calls to the, the district nurse on one of the islands. He, he made a phone call to the postman at a different island uh, they managed to narrow down where the vessel was sitting in which bay. And I think it was the, the, the local butcher that said, yeah, sure, sure. The MV, whatever it was, is sitting outside my front window. So because we had a, let's call it an intelligence network, which is like every single one of you guys, because every citizen in Scotland has a vested interest really in protecting society and protecting revenues, we have to have a structure where you can lift the phone or go and knock somebody's door. We don't have that anymore. 
And I can actually uh, vouch for that because we did used to see lights across the lock and then heading up the hill and there were it was a drugs um a drugs related thing. And um secondly we had a hotel in the village that was um run by someone in Glasgow. It was really money money laundering going on there. And again, people were seeing lorries arriving at three o'clock in the morning to do the deliveries, which was a wee bit abnormal. But in you know 20, 30 years ago, we just phoned up Trevor Rayner, who was our customs guy, and they've just all gone. It, it, it actually leads on to a very serious, not very funny issue that the north of Ireland is only 12, 12 miles away from Scotland, and their, their, their troubles are theoretically over. But actually, uh, with, with the amounts of money that can be made through smuggling north, south, south, north, the Green Tribe and the Orange Tribe stand to make a lot of money, uh, where it brings about maybe not so much the political side, but organised crime and gangsterism. That's just off our coast. In terms of risk management, would we be wanting to put resources into, into Sky or Campbelltown and all the rest of it just to keep an eye on traffic? I suggest we would. Um, thanks, Bill. Do you think that given the current Scottish government's um, inertia that we've left this too late and that we should have had this ready to go in 2014? An excellent question, given that a lot of my mates are still in the SNP and still work very hard for the cause, it would be wrong of me to point the finger at the party and indeed ScotGov. However, your point is very pertinent in terms of the white paper that was produced, because my God, was it rubbish from a customs point of view. If you if you actually have a copy of the, the white paper and look to customs and borders, all it does is strongly suggest recreating the dysfunctional, poor governance that the UK currently has. So, you know, let's not bother. Let, let's, let's take a blank piece of A4 and between you and I, we can come up with a better system than that. And it doesn't start with recreating the rubbish that we've got just now. One very quick supplemental question. If the customs side is about revenue and protecting investment, do you think the immigration side should be a public health issue with a completely different skill set and control? Uh, I would agree in terms of immigration has to be finessed a lot more. I think to have the, the Theresa May unwelcome society, guys wearing uniform that's, that's black with silver on it, that suggests a different era that's, that I'm not comfortable with. Is that a good thing? Are they only there to scare people away when we all know that Scotland desperately needs workers? With ability and that the, the the immigration gig has to be has to be looked at in an awful lot more positive way than what we've got with London right now. That was a really interesting presentation. Um, I'm I'm actually sitting in in Greenock, and you mentioned Greenock um, earlier. Um, so I mean, as you know, there's huge traffic comes through. The, the trouble is that Peel ports have a, a huge influence on the whole of the Clyde um, and, you know, their interests are really, there are other holdings down in Liverpool and so on. So I wondered what implications that has for, you know, independence for, for Scotland. And um, it's, it's, a very, it's a very pertinent question because I got the figures uh, on the Greenock container traffic from Peelport's website. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very clear that what they see is Greenock being a feeder hub mm -hmm. for Liverpool. And therefore, from a commercial point of view, you can sort of get that. Um, because, for example, the, the bigger containers right now, the bigger container ships, they can take some like 20, 23,000 containers for, for each vessel. 23,000 boxes on a, on a ship. Greenock can't handle that right now. It's, it's back to the other, what the other lady asked about. What, what does the Scottish government want to do about infrastructure? Mm -hmm. I can see all sorts of commercial issues if Edinburgh was to say, well, actually, we want 
that container port to be totally within uh, Scottish uh, control. Uh, well, that 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 goes against multinationalism. But on the other hand, I totally hoist in what you're saying that if we are going to put money into infrastructure, whether it's the West Coast Coast, then there's got to be a, a measure of control that the Scottish government would be happy with. I mean, the, the, the big point about Greenock is, as I understand it, is, is the export traffic for the whiskey. Mm -hmm. You know, it's absolutely massive. So why would we want, not want to facilitate that? I can see, I can see the political issues. There's people saying that um, maybe that um, nukes, nuclear submarines are going to be parked up at Hunterston and stuff like that. Mm. Um, that can't be a good thing. Yeah. I mean, the other the other point, and um, I'm a bit unclear about this, but I think Peel ports are also act as harbour masters, which which means that there was there was a seemed to be a conflict of interest lately when there were the uh, cruise ships. Um, and Peel Ports wanted to discharge the, the, the crews into Greenock, you know, at the, the time when the coronavirus was at its, its height. So, you know, I mean, they aren't always acting in the best interests of the local community, certainly uh, the, the wider community in Scotland. So, it's, But it's, it's, it's a very pertinent point, though, because I've just said hard borders is a very, very bad thing. Uh -huh. um, Every country has the right to close their borders. Let's call it war or let's call it a pandemic. Mm -hmm. we, we have got to have that and it mm -hmm. has to be in our constitution so everybody knows what the rules are. But that, that's a kind of serious point. If I can just throw in a green up anecdote that I was involved in indirectly. Oh, rain. <laughs> well, yeah, it was raining that day. Um, <laughs> was um, one of my colleagues was down in the, the container terminal uh, just mooching about patrolling as we call it and he came across a, a, a box, a, a container which allegedly was bananas from the West Indies but being a switched on dude he <laughs> noticed that the, the freezer unit wasn't switched on <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was from the West Indies with fruit and, and there was something not quite right. So anyway, he, to his credit, opens the thing up and it was absolutely jam-packed with, with drugs from South America. The point being, we don't have those guys patrolling our harbours and uh, airports anymore. Mm -hmm. and one of the things that Carol, uh, that I sent to her, I was a bit shocked myself that um, freelibrary.com had a list of all the drug seizures in the west of Scotland over the last 20 odd years. It's huge. That hasn't stopped. Hello there. Uh, thanks for the talk, Bill. Uh, really interesting and yeah, totally agree with you. Uh, we need to tax the big corporations, close the, get the tax gap. Yeah, and I think, as you say, the Scottish constitution is crucial. Um, I'm sitting here opposite uh, Unst, which you also mentioned along with Greenock. Um, I've got I, about I six there. questions. All right. I, I, worked, I worked in Inst. I've got a couple of Inst stories if you want, but finish your question. Yeah, yeah. I've got about six, but I'll keep it to two and a half. Right. And uh, the half is, I just missed the percentages you said at the start there on the the split of offshore versus onshore revenue. I think it seemed like quite a low percentage of the revenue lost was attributed to offshore, which kind of, uh, not that I know anything about it, but I imagined it was uh, bigger than that. So I'd be interested to know more about that. And um I guess my, my other question is around the hard border. I totally take your point that our our border is the edge of our exclusive economic zone, really. But, you know, we do have a big chunk of our traffic going across the English border. And it seems to me like if it if a hard border border is a red herring for Scotland, like why is it so serious for Ireland? And then my last question would be, which which countries around the world do you think are doing this best and that we can learn from? Um, if I answer your second question first, the, 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 the Irish and the EU, um, if, if you look on the EU website uh, to do with um, the customs matters, they are absolutely 100% certain that, the, that, that it's essential there's no hard border. Therefore, who is it that's arguing for hard border? Who mentions hard border? 
And why is that not a red herring? Because it's actually not relevant to what the EU is trying to achieve. Because when you look at the correspondence between the EU and London, the hard border mention is always coming from London, taking back yeah. control and all the rest of it. But actually, that's in absolutely nobody's interest. That have you had, have you been to North of Ireland? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I worked there for a while. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, you know how the border works. Yeah. You know, it, it zigzags all over the, the planet. So how do you enforce a hard border there? I mean, well, in fact, I'll answer that in a different way. The British Army uh, put in a hard border and it didn't work. The smugglers laughed at it. Hard borders don't work. It costs you and I uh, billions of pounds to put in a hard border in the 1980s and 90s when the whole of Europe was heading towards freedom of movement of people and goods. That, mm. that was rock. And it was London that did that. Yeah, yeah. Hard, hard borders, if you're talking Fortress Israel or something like that, well, well, that's fine, but let, we shouldn't do it. Yeah, I guess folks' fear is that we could still have, people are thinking they're not going to be free to, completely free to drive over the English border, and that could be a reality if England decides to have a hard Brexit. But did they, frankly, if, if we are uh, independent and we're aspiring to return to the EU, what London does is entirely up to them. And mm -hmm. the, 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 the key thing that Dublin and Edinburgh would want to do is to get them to, to calm down and to tone down what, what they're trying to achieve. Absolutely. Because one of the, the key things, having worked in uh, in, in the Republic and in the North, when there was endemic uh, fuel smuggling. The key to that is harmonisation of taxes, because clearly if the, the, the fuel is an awful lot cheaper on one side of the border than the other, you're going to get smuggling. Mm -hmm. So if you can have a grown up conversation with London and say, look, we'll make it the same and completely remove the incentive to smuggle, is that yeah. not a good thing? Yeah, yeah. So Sorry, who, do, who should... does that? Who does that well? Do you think, I, like on the fringes of the EU, for example? Well, the the, the, the good example is uh, the Norway Sweden border, um, mm -hmm. because what 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 the two services do there is that zigzag down the Norway Sweden border. You have custom stations kind of zigzagged, and the custom station does uh, Swedish imports and Norwegian exports. And it's the same officers, it's the same team of guys that are doing it. And they facilitate trade because at all times, the whole point of a modern customs service is to facilitate trade. Mm -hmm. It's not to create barriers because the only, the, you know, the only people that suffer from that are uh, the government from losing revenue, but also the guy in the street. Because those costs have to be put on you and me. What was your okay. first question? Sorry. And the the offshore the revenue lost due to offshore offshoring you know offshore tax havens and so on. I can't, you yeah. mentioned a figure early on, but I, I just missed it. it okay, there was a couple couple a bit of slides lower than there. I thought. It, I thought it was a bigger deal. Um, there was a couple of slides uh, where over the same period the, the the slides are from Business for Scotland. You can get them on their website. And it shows over the same period. Normally, oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't mean offshore oil and gas. I mean offshore tax evasion, like well, uh, offshore uh, like the Germans been, clamped down on, as you mentioned. The figure that I mentioned was to do with the tax gap, uh, 120 billion a year. Yeah. Offshore evasion was five percent. So that's. I thought I thought it was a bigger deal than that. Okay. Um, well, 5% of 120 billion is still quite a big deal. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, you know, the, the, where, where, you know, if you're interested in the subject, and, and I think people should be, is uh, a website called mm -hmm. Tax Justice Network. And that's run by a guy called Professor Richard Murphy. Um, he's a black belt ninja mm -hmm. in this stuff, but he's very, <laughs> very good to read. He, he, he's, there's a book called The Joy of Tax, which is, yeah. but, and I think that's the way, you know, within a revenue strategy, customs and excise should be thinking in terms of Richard Murphy stuff.
Hi there. Um, yeah, I was just wanting to ask about, um, I mean, it's maybe already been answered about Peel ports, but, you know, there are very few ports in Scotland which are in public ownership anymore. Would that be a barrier to an efficient customs and excise service, the fact that uh, the ports, I mean, I think it was mentioned about harbour masters and things like that. W would that be a barrier? And do you think that, um, I mean, that we should be trying to uh, develop uh, ports on the east coast with a view to a more efficient customs and excise service? At, at the end of the day, uh, customs and excise are a, a law enforcement organisation and they will do what the government of the day tell them. We'd already addressed the, the issue of the, the east coast ports, the rural ports to the continent in Scandinavia. Our government must seriously have a look at infrastructure and infrastructure investment in order to bring that about. Where the customs and excise fit into that? Well, when you do anything in a, a port or an airport, the trader has to actually ask permission to put in sheds or security areas and all the rest of it. So you've got this balance between what the government would like to happen and what does happen, you, you've, got, you've got that uh, crossover between trade and government. If we go to the other end of the spectrum and Edinburgh government says, let's not bother investing in infrastructure, let's just send all our trucks, all our, all, all our trade down to Hull in Newcastle and Felixstowe as they do currently, well, I would suggest that's a bad thing. Where are the ScotGov plans right now for that investment in our infrastructure? Well, you see, that was always the idea of having all these uh, selling off all the ports in the 1990s was that what was complained of was that they weren't making any investment in, uh, in um, infrastructure and if they were privatised that the private guys would be putting more infrastructure investment in and that was the justification for it. But I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, you, you said that it's a law enforcement issue, customs and exercise, so it's, you're, you're suggesting that it really wouldn't make a difference whether they were pub publicly owned or privately owned uh, it, 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 because it'd be a law enforcement thing. Well, it's, then, it's, there is a crossover there because what the French, uh, they have a term called guichet unique, which is like single window, and it's accepted uh, across the planet where if you have a port, whether it's private or public, you have a one-stop shop for commerce to facilitate them. So you have the customs guy, you have the, the health guys, you have the banks, you have the, the, the freight companies, etc., etc. And it's essential that customs and excise in an independent Scotland is on the front foot so that whatever port facilities or airport facilities are there, the, 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 the Scottish Customs Service facilitate and assist. Because actually, at the end of the day, if there's a lot more trade coming through your port or airport, then invariably the customs revenue goes up. So you could argue it pays for itself. Hello, Bill. Thanks very much. Uh, great Hi, talk. Andy. So I'd like to know, is there any cost of plans about how much a Scottish customs revenue service, how, how much seed capital, if you like, would be needed to get that going? How much uh, employment could you imagine in a fully a service big enough for Scotland and, and lastly where would we find those people from and when we find them how do we train them and is this an opportunity to kind of almost rebrand or soften up customer next time and make it more like a kind of a you're doing a social service and building the economy and society up rather than being a law enforcer but obviously aspects of both. Okay, but part of your answer is in one of the links that Carol is going to put out at the end, because myself and a former customs colleague did a white paper for Common Wheel, and 95% of the answers are in that document in terms of how we would see uh, a Scottish customs and excise being set up. We're talking about ballpark a thousand people, and it's largely based on the Norwegian model. It works for them. So why would why would you not want to start with some similar similar size of uh, population? Uh, how much would it cost to set up? I would suggest that whatever the answer is to that, and uh, I mentioned what I mentioned earlier on, that in terms of customs offices in 
in Sky or Shetland, they've all been closed down. So that that's going to be quite quite large capital costs. You know, where are the vehicles going to come from? All of that kind of good stuff. I'll answer that by saying that, for example, um, if it costs thirty thousand pounds as a salary for a, a customs officer, and his one of his key performance indicators annually is fined 300,000 undeclared revenue. Well, you can work out right away if you could set up a business that, that gave you a return of 90%, then, then you would want to do that. So what I'm suggesting is if you've got a thousand, a thousand customs officers sparking away within the system and they're all bringing in undeclared revenue because the difference between undeclared and somebody putting in their VAT return, that guy's paying the revenue. We're looking for the other stuff. We're looking at taking bite-sized chunks of the tax gap. Then actually, we're back to the argument, why would you have 3,000 DWP guys looking for cash windy cleaners? Or would you rather have a similar amount of trained people who are going to raise serious amounts of revenue. What I'm talking about, uh, I hoist in the point about uh, would I want customs and excise to be a social service? That's kind of difficult as a law enforcement organisation. On the other hand, there are many, many ways that to facilitate and educate is a huge part of the role. Because actually, you can raise just as much revenue by getting traders to be compliant. Where would we get these people from? Um, I don't think there'll be very many available people to be handed over, if that makes any sense. The UKBF dudes, they're immigration guys. The, 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 the UKBF guys at the airports and ports are, are not customs officers. And we get into quite a lot of technical issues there, which I'll steer away from. But I would like to think that Part of, your, part of my, the, the answer to that is that the World Customs Organization has an international network of customs universities. What, what that does is throughout the planet, uh, for example, Germany has about 12 universities who are part of INCU, the UK has none. That we would want, it would be essential that the Scottish Treasury would say, such and such a Scottish university is now going to have customs revenue type degrees, which we're looking at probably kind of educated people initially, but then you can improve them still further by sending them down to the World Customs Organization University in Brisbane and, and get them to, to, to bring back the best practices. What I'm saying is because collecting revenue is a kind of cerebral type of job, where, you know, a 20 foot container full of cartons of cigarettes, times VAT, times excise and all the rest, it becomes a bit of a, it becomes a bit of a game, but you've got to get it right. And I have to say that, well, let's just use the army in the borders. Well, actually, do you know what? A soldier isn't a very good customs officer because he can't really handle the the, the cerebral side of it any more than a police can, can actually, I must confess. Yeah, it comes back to the oil. I remember coming across that a while ago, the, the 287 million that the UK paid out to Shell, BP, and for, for the privilege of pumping our oil out the ground. Whereas when you, when you went, went to Norway, they had collected sort of 2.7 billion pounds equivalent in krona and my concern was one was and i haven't actually managed to find out why the licensing agreements signed by the uk are so detrimental and so beneficial to to the uk and beneficial to norway with that discrepancy it makes me wonder what was the length of those licensing rules and would that then prohibit Scotland from changing them that would be signed into this for the duration of their their license? Um, an excellent question, which I don't know the answer to. However, uh, my experience in West Africa, where countries became independent 
and the corporations were already on site. The corporations had to very quickly adapt to what the capital the capital wanted. Aye, but they they also the the way I was very much aware. I mean, maybe get Tom Wells back in because the the first thing that the African West African countries did was pull in advisors from Shetland Islands Council to negotiate their terms with the oil companies because everybody realised that Shetland had negotiated their terms and it really sort of it benefited Shetland. And I just wish that the, the Shetland Islanders, their council and negotiators had actually done the job for Westminster and consequently Scotland. For what it's worth, uh, I worked a fair bit in Shetland and my claim to fame along with one of the other guys is when the first uh, tanker came into Sulem Vo, um, we, we got our uniforms all sorted because we were about to be in the telly, white summer caps and all this sort of stuff. And then the consternation was, why aren't they bringing the tanker in? And it was round about that point that Shetland Island Council had submitted their list of you're going to have to sign this before that vessel gets into Salem Bow. So it was something like four days after we thought we were going to get our two seconds in the sun, being seen to be the first customs guys boarding this vessel. It was entirely to the credit, the, the, the Shetland Council, that they pulled that off. Why didn't London, do you know what? It's one of these questions. I, I'm in Aberdeen right now, and part, part of that answer was the dog in the street here could tell you that the infrastructure in Aberdeen in the early 70s, uh, mid 70s, was shocking in terms of it was just a bucksy parochial Aberdeen city. Um, and I'll get a hard time for my Aberdeen pals for that. But what the what the oil industry said was you need uh, better rail infrastructure, roads, and uh, an, an airport. We'll we'll build them for you, bucksy, because it helps us which the initial reaction locally was, geez, oh, that's tremendous. But the word was that the Labour government at the time were busy telling everybody oil's going to run out by half past three, and therefore you can hardly have multi-gazillion infrastructure into Aberdeen when they're saying the oil's going to run out by tea time. And actually it killed uh, the infrastructure in Aberdeen stone dead. Aberdeen's only just got a bypass last year. Yeah, yeah. 40 years after they all arrived. Me, I'm a small business owner. My main supplier comes from Belfast. A lot of the goods are made in Ireland. But here we are, job vacancies, customs declaration specialist for the Institute of Export and International Trade. To recruit experienced customs declaration specialists to work on its co-delivery of the Trader Support Service the new service provided by HM government for firms trading between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. What on earth is going on that none of my suppliers know what's happening? The people like me are suddenly not being able to get goods now. It, it, is it is relevant um, because, I, you know, the, the, the UK government is, is bluffing massively. If you go onto the, the internet, you can find the Northern Ireland Customs Trading Academy, which is set up by HMG. And you can sign on for an hour's course to, I think they're running them every couple of days, and you get a chance to um, listen to a consultant telling you what they think might happen in terms of documentation say for your, people like yourself who want to uh, export or import to the north and or the republic and then this this northern ireland trading academy has no, no other courses no other assistance other than these bucksy one hour courses what i'm saying is that colleagues that i know in the south and the north are getting zero direction from the revenue departments because they don't know what Brexit's going to mean yet. To what extent are the inadequacies of HMRC due to the revolving door whereby people from the private sector and the big four accountancy firms not only advise, but make policy for you? A great question. Um, it's shameful, um, but it also underlines 
how, what what control, what influence at government level the the the, the multinationals have, um, because it's it's nothing short of incredible. Would uh, like to see a Scottish government ensuring that that sort of thing can't happen. Absolutely, it, it's it's beyond belief. Um, great question. I mean, it, it, it adds to the, the 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 tax gap and all the rest of it. Because what it means is um, the, the corporations uh, are just not contributing to the community's pot in a manner that they should do. Hi, Bill. Um, I was thinking, um, Gray McCormack, when he spoke about the replacement of the council tax with annual ground rent, um, they, he's obviously come up with some sort of scheme, um, well fitted out proposal to be contemplated and has sent it to Kate Forbes with a view to looking at it for an independent Scotland. I, I was wondering if, if somebody has done a similar sort of thing for, you actually mentioned that you had done a similar thing for the common wheel. So I suspect you've maybe, you've maybe answered the question. I'm thinking not just for the, for the SNP because I, I personally don't see that the SNP will necessarily be the one that, that's um, running an independent Scotland. I think by then maybe the party will have um, moved on and into different parties Come independence. So somebody needs to put forward an, a proposal in this way. I was just wondering if you had done it, if not, would you be willing to do it? Well, I think uh, this comes back to national revenue strategy mm -hmm. and the party in power, or, or maybe it's, it's, it's combined parties, have to agree on national revenue strategy. Um, when it comes to things like council tax, that's not really customs and excise. On the other hand, it's part of the national revenues strategy and how do you want that played? Well, what, what is reasonable to collect? We're, we're, we're talking about tax burden, you know, that in, in terms of as, as a guy that's recently retired, do I want revaluation in my house to something ridiculous in a way that the Duke of Drumshuk and all points north, um, he's paying hee-haw. I mean, that's a sweeping generalization answer there. But it's, it's something that's going to have to be looked at by finance experts who hopefully, if you get the right sort of advice, they're not neocon. And you bring in guys like, uh, I keep on mentioning Richard, Professor Richard Murphy, what he suggests, and he's at the London School of Economics, brain the size of a planet. He, he, he looks at revenue and tax completely differently from everybody else, but it's just common sense and logic that the tax burden side of it, um, for example, what I'm not suggesting is that Customs and Excise are, are a, a rote violer organization, which takes money aggressively from uh, traders. I'm not suggesting that at all. What I'm suggesting is that within the big picture, customs and excise is one cog in the revenue wheel that somebody's got to finesse it and all the rest of it. If that sounds a bit like, hold on a minute, next week I'm going to teach you how to nail jelly to the ceiling. Well, there's an element of that. But on the other hand, the EU, the World Customs Organization, it's not the first time your question's been asked of them. So I'd, I'd be reasonably confident you would like to think within the customs and excise, within our new treasury, that people are saying, well, do you know what? That university has really, really good stuff, up to date, spot on academic measures. So, so let's send out a team of guys to, to Oslo and, and Copenhagen and Dublin, you know, all of these good things and pull in, I don't like the phrase best practice, but pull in all the best practice. And, and actually, because one size doesn't fit all, when it comes to local taxation, well, the Norwegians push it down to, to um, the lowest common denominator, as you would hope, because Sky Folk should, or, or, uh, or, or any place, uh, you know, that's, that's, that they deserve to decide themselves how revenues are raised and spent. If that, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, well, I enjoyed your talk, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, something that's current at the moment up in the Highlands is the uh, question of uh, free ports. And um, the Tories are pushing for um, one in Cromarty Firth and uh, dangling the possibility of hundreds and hundreds of jobs for locals. So the Tories in Highland Council are all for it, uh, but um, the SNP group um, are not. And um, it's going to be discussed at the uh, SNP conference this weekend with the whole question of free ports. So I thought it might be a topical question to ask you an opinion. OK, uh, simplistically, a free port is to, to pick any port in Scotland and put a big fence around it that the customs guy doesn't really cross. He doesn't go in there. So everything I've been talking about doesn't apply because beyond that fence in the free port, those dudes are doing what they like. You might have a customs guy at either end saying, OK, if that... 20 foot container full of widgets is about to come into um, home use, come into the community, then there's a customs in, uh, interest. But I could, my personal opinion is to talk about free ports is to miss the point a wee bit because what the Tories are doing is they're turning the whole island of the UK into a free port. Deregulation everywhere. Get rid of, well, in fact, they get rid of customs and excise in 2005. So they are to, to <laughs> it's difficult to, 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 to give a response to this without swearing. Um, the, 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 the focus is on a deregulated island off the coast of Europe. Mrs. Merkel put it an awful lot better than I was about to put it. She said something like, it is not in the EU's interest to have uh, a city state like Singapore that's deregulated off the coast of the EU. You know, qui bono, who, who gains the multinationals? Because I'm going to swear, to, 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 the free port aspect is booting the whole out of it. They've achieved their aim with hard Brexit. To have wee free ports is like, God, you know, what, what is it you guys want? Well, some some people um, in Highland Council or over in that area think it's a trap, a Tory trap, because if Scotland wants to get back into the EU and the EU are against free ports, um, you know, that's going to look pretty bad with the EU if we're taking them all around Scotland. The, the whole island is about to become a free port. Do you like movies? Okay, Godfather 2, you seen that one? <laughs> no. Okay, there's a great bit in the movie where um, the two capos have come from uh, the States to Cuba and they're doing the hedonistic back in aliens thing. And there's a scene where uh, they're on the roof, this is Hugmanay 1959, they're on the roof of a, a hotel and they're celebrating, they're, 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 they're tanning the champagne because they have the dictator Batista in his back pocket and the, the, the gangsters actually say, America is only 60 miles away and we've got no customs guys, no labour laws. How good is this going to be? And that kind of sums up what the multinationals are achieving with this island off the coast of EU. The only difference is because The Godfather 2 was uh, was fiction, um, that's where it should remain. What they're achieving right now, what, what they're achieving right now is nothing short of incredible. No, no, it's, it's been really, really, really good for me because obviously uh, it's the open, open forum thing. And um, there's been a lot of thought provoking questions that, you know, it's, it's kind of, refined and defined my thought and I've noted a couple of things I'm, I'm going to have to go away and have a look at um, because the questions will, will definitely uh, um, you know reappear but all, all I would like to say to people is you know thanks very much that it's, it's been absolutely fascinating it's been great that the, the, the one single thing I would like to put across is to have 
our own self-government and a brand new custom service is actually very, very exciting and very, very positive because when you're working in Africa or Eastern Europe with brand new custom services, you can hold up the, here's the thing not to do, and it's usually marked HMG London, and here's what you can do for your own country. And do you know what? It's, it's London would call Angola or uh, Ethiopia economic basket cases. Do you know what? They've got far better systems than the UK currently has. Yes, everyone. <laughs> Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Bill. You've been listening to the Yes Group Spotlight programme on Indie Live Radio, and we've been listening to Bill Austin speaking about an independent Scotland's options for revenue, borders and defence. You heard him give a short talk to Voices for Scotland, which is a part of the Scottish Independence Convention. And we had some question and answers in that audience. And then we moved to question and answers from the folk at Yes Sky on Lachalsh, who had been listening to the same talk um, from Bill. If you'd like to read more about this whole topic of revenues, borders and events, you can buy Bill Austin's book. It's called Frontline Duty. You can find out how to get hold of a copy of Bill's book from his website, which is at BillAustinAuthor.com. BillAustinAuthor.com These talks were both recorded in November of 2020. Since then, the paper which Bill wrote for the Scottish Independence Convention on Borders, Revenues and Defence has now been published and you can find that on their website, which is at independenceconvention.scot. That's independenceconvention.scot. You'll find their full set of transition papers, they're building up a library of discussion papers which aim to set out answers to important and justified questions about the institutions and structures required by an independent Scotland. The discussion papers answer two basic questions. What do we need and how does this differ from the current arrangement? So Bill Austin's paper is called Independent Scotland's Smart Borders. And again, you can download it from independenceconvention.scot We hope you've enjoyed this week's programme and tune in next week for another Yes Group Spotlight.